time. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining me for this virtual moderated discussion where words fail, Ira Seikenberg and Devira S. Tarragon in discussion. I am Dr. Tola Porter. I'm an art historian and the Low Art Museum's educator for academic and public programs. And I'm honored to moderate this conversation in which we'll explore the themes, materials, and accomplishments of Iris Eichenberg's mid-career survey curated by Devira Tarragon and now on view at the Low Art Museum. So let me cover just a little bit of housekeeping so the program runs smoothly. I've enabled closed captions. You can click on this show captions button and you'll be able to see a transcript of what we're saying. Mm -hmm. Also, there'll be a Q&A at the end of the program. And so if you could type your questions into the chat box um, any time along the way, if you have a question during the middle of our discussion, feel free to type and I'll be able to uh, read those and review them along the way and um, bring your voice into our uh, conversation. So I'd like to mention a few of our exhibitions. Several are on their way out closing and we have until January 14 to see the beautiful um, exhibition of Iris's work here, several other shows. And coming up, we have a, a phenomenal photography exhibition um, called Reckonings and Reconstructions, Southern Photography from the Do Good Fund. And also we'll get to experience Devira Terrigan's curatorial prowess yet again uh, with this wonderful show, Anatomy of a Collector, Susan Grant Lewin and the Art Jewelry World, 1982 to 2023. So uh, this last year and this year are strong years for art jewelry at the low. And that's really thanks to Devira's vision. <laughs> We have upcoming programs. Uh, tomorrow night is going to be a phenomenal uh, evening with the artist John Miller in attendance to talk about his um, pop art glass art, which is really kind of fun. And then we're going to have a beautiful, intimate um, storytelling by the artist who um, collaborated on an, an installation about banned books. And you can go to our website to see more about those, register. And if you're in town, we'd love to see you. Finally, but crucially, uh, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this exhibition, including the State of Florida Division of Arts and Culture, Florida Council on Arts and Culture, National Endowment, Coral Gables, Bose Arts Miami, the Funding Arts Network, and Wasserman Projects, and of course, our low members. But I'd like to especially acknowledge the support of the Art Jewelry Forum. This project was made possible by a Susan Beach Mid-Career Artist Grant awarded to Iris Eichenberg, and the show would not have happened without her support. So, the purpose of today's program is to explore the themes, materials, and accomplishments of Iris Eichenberg's mid-career survey through a moderated conversation between Iris and Devira. And let me introduce our distinguished speakers. Iris Eichenberg is head of metalsmithing and artist in residence at Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, where since 2006, she's taught scores of students for almost two decades. Born and raised on a farm on the outskirts of Göttingen, I'm sure I said that wrong, you'll correct me, Eris, Germany, Eichenberg initially followed expectations and trained as a nurse. After practicing for several years, she decided to pursue a career in art and enrolled at the Garrett Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam, where she focused on metalsmithing and art jewelry. After graduating, Eichenberg taught at Rietveld, eventually serving as head of its jewelry department for almost a decade. Museums have been interested in Eichenberg's work since the beginning of her career, and her work is included in such notable public collections as the Stedelijk Museum and the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, Coda Museum in the Netherlands, the Met uh, in New York, as well as the Cooper Hewitt and the Museum of Arts and Design, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Texas, Die Neue Sammlung in Munich, and the Schmuck Museum in Pforzheim. Eichenberg has organized numerous exhibitions, lectured extensively, and conducted workshops worldwide, influencing countless international jewelry artists. Devira S. Tarragon was formerly curator at the Detroit Institute of the Arts and the Toledo Museum of Art and director of exhibitions and programs at the Racine Art Museum. An independent curator, Tarragon served as a consultant to Ball State University from 2011 to 2019, first to its David Owsley Museum of Art, and then to its School of Art. 
She is currently consulting curator to the Low Art Museum, University of Miami, where she continues to help build and interpret its holdings of contemporary glass and ceramics and art jewelry. Iris Eichenberg, Where Words Fail, is one of more than 40 exhibitions that she has organized and traveled over her career. Her shows have included examinations of the work of such notables as Romar Bearden, Wendell Castle, Viola Frey, and Albert Paley, and the first scholarly investigation of Israeli jewelry for American audiences. Since the millennium, her focus has been on women artists and a prolific writer Tarragon has received accolades for many of her publications. Now, with those uh, wonderful bios uh, read, and we can understand who we're speaking with today, I'd like to show you the sort of themes that we're trying to approach, we're using to approach this work, um, and uh, in an effort to sort of deepen our understanding of Eichenberg's artistic intent. Um, so narrative versus iconography, process and material, architecture and location versus portraiture and cultural identity. And so let's just jump right in to the first theme. And uh, soon enough, you'll stop hearing from me and you'll get to hear from our speakers. So Iris, the first question is really to you. And it's really about the idea that there really are several modes of art making. Um, they let's think about perhaps a range between a descriptive narrative approach and a more personal iconographic mode. How would you characterize the balance between iconography and narrative in your work? And do you think iconography allows more room for the viewer to co-create the object's meaning? You mentioned two words, which uh, actually um, those words I have a complicated relationship with. So let's unpack that. Um, I do think that uh, my work is sometimes perceived as the narrative work as much as I try not to do that. Um, I do not want to illustrate or narrate. I don't want to dictate an experience. I hope to provide for an experience and an encounter with the work rather than telling you a story. Um, but as I often use found objects or things which are already charged, it is very hard to avoid that there is already a narrative going because of the material choice um, or the, the, the context in which I'm placing myself by making do with certain materials we all do already have a pre-existing uh, relationship with. Um, iconography, we, I mean, we, we talked about that before. I do think that is something which was very often decided after the event. Um, an icon is not deciding to become an icon, but circumstances, political, economic, uh, sociological circumstances in certain times make for certain things to stay on, to stick out um, and mark moments in time, life, lifespans. Um, so iconography is something I would never choose to foreground, but I think that is rather something what happened over time that certain pieces I have made, I could also say became classics. Um, I became known for certain pieces, which obviously because of timing and when they were made, um, really resonated uh, with an audience. And I think we could talk about the wool hats and um, mm. and the way how I, I sort of interrogate um, place, space, landscape. So as I said, it's, it's uh, hard for me to say, to judge that because I think that's also, has a lot to do with like how I am positioned. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, I really try to avoid narration because I don't want to work to be legible. I do not want you to um, get to terms with each individual part of a work. If those things do not come together as an experience, I see that as a failure. I don't know if I'm answering your questions uh, like that, but... Um, I think you are. Is there anything you'd like to say about these two works that I think it's interesting to see them in juxtaposition, something that's quite large and uh, installed on the floor, as you can sort of see in this install shot here, I tried to give a sense of the contextual installation a little bit. And this this quite small but beautiful pendant 
in relation to this object anyway, uh, which is displayed up here uh, in, um, you know, uh, in a table amongst many things. Um, and maybe they both um, sort of speak a little bit to this idea that um, although they reference um, really recognizable things, they're also quite, uh, they also hold back a lot of um, telling you what they are. To, I mean, I think there's so many lenses to which you could see my work. Um, there are also a lot of conversations we could have about the physical body and the representation of body parts to then in how far the inner and outer landscapes exchanged. You can see this field clearly as, as a physical uh, bodily experience, but you can also see it as a field and a landscape. Mm -hmm. um, the two bones and the golden teeth, it's um, very physical, it's very direct, but there's also this sort of a notion of abstraction going going on, which I probably not able to to um, see anymore. But I think that is something left to an external viewer. Um, there are a lot of similarities in those two pieces, but I can only actually sort of um, see that after the event of making it. Mm -hmm. um, as often as I try to sort of really step out of a certain material use. I, I very often shift materials as subject matters because it feels like plagiarizing myself to to revisit things. I obviously can't escape that and I do re revisit subject matters and, um, and process, which um, I, I need I need a long time. I mean, this is, I think one of the, um, Good things to have a mid-career show that you look better back, back at things and i'm with the viewer who encounters the work um have to come to terms and understand what i'm actually looking at mm -hmm. um yeah. that makes a lot of sense and i'll, I'll turn the the uh, spotlight over to devira for a second asking um devira can you speak about the timeliness of these concerns that iris is bringing up um and of her own of her own of and then also um how those the, how that worked with bringing together this mid-career survey oh hang on you're Devira. muted hang on one second Devira I'll make sure let's get you unmuted one moment I just asked there we go so Iris came to Cranbrook in 2006, 2007. And if you ask me now how we met or, or when we met, what was the situation, I, you know, and I can't say, but I do know that since the last part of the first decade of, of, of this century, I've been a regular visitor there um, at her studio, doing studio visits. And from the beginning, I felt the need and felt the, 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 the there was a, a real, you feel a need for a show. Here's an artist who is enormously prolific. Every time I came to her studio, she would be doing something completely different. Mm -hmm. And it, whether it, it was through material or process or even thematically, mm -hmm. it was something completely different. And so, it was a, a long time desire that I had to do such an exhibition, but it was an interesting thing that although I had talked to various um, potential venues, it was really in those first days of the pandemic when we were all struck, number one, with the sense of isolation, with the sense of feeling that you know, we needed a safe haven that we were, uh, that there were concerns, it was discussion about identity, be it cultural, be it gender identity, that really this whole idea for this show coalesced. And um, I was able to, to talk with and convince Joanne Edwards of the um, director of the Museum of Craft and Design for the need to organize such an exhibition. Mm -hmm. So had the pandemic, you know, it, it was it it was an outgrowth. It one had, there were some wonderful things, yes, that did come up come from um um the from the pandemic, even though 
you know, Joanne and other people knew what was going on um, in um, Iris's studio. Um, you, we had talked about, yes, Iris has said often that if she were to organize such a show, it would be very different than the one that I have put together. Yes, shows are in one respect the vision of the curator, but, and we are very, very different. I mean, here is some, somebody who's German, studied in Europe, um, worked in the, the, um, the United Kingdom and um, in, in Amsterdam and um, is here now in the United States. And I admit to being very focused as um, an American curator. I mean, that is my specialty. I'm very, but I am interested in artists who work in cross media within the larger context of um, contemporary developments and in, in developments in contemporary art. So in terms of her interest in exploring various materials and processes, but at the same time, reflecting for me, seeing what the 20th and 21st centuries are have been about and are evolving into, she is very much within that larger context. And I see my role has always been about contextual, as a curator, mm -hmm. about contextualizing the work of the artist whom I am looking at. I couldn't help, and, and, and I've asked that we include, you know, Georgia O'Keeffe's Black Iris, which is all well, very well known to us, because I've, in, in, in thinking about Iris's work, I have always seen this kind of relationship with, again, contextualizing the work within um, the period we are looking at. You know, O'Keeffe initially, was seen with a very, very, was perhaps because of um, of her husband, Alfred Stieglitz, was seen as having a very strong feminine um, uh, statement, strong sexual con connotations. And I look at, and when, when Iris created, right before we were finishing up the, the checklist, this wonderful peace field, Yes, one sees the same on one level, one sees the same kind of sexual references in it. But on the other hand, there are so, like O'Keefe, whom we now recognize as a, a, a multifaceted, multi-layered artist, it's that same perspective that we bring to, to a piece like Field. It is, although it is very, Iris is not somebody who does talk about her work. And when in, 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 the, in the periods of, 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 of sitting at her studio, both before we began working on the show and then as we worked on the show, where she would a lot of the times just, you know, she would, we would be very actively engaged in discussions about certain pieces, but rarely would she slip with a little piece of autobiographical information slip out. But there were times when she, it has happened. And knowing this, this, and it, it was these, when these moments happened, I would be very quick to jot them down because I felt, you know, it is, it's, it is the artist expressing herself, it's expressing her innermost thoughts. And it is that which comes out um, in, in, in this in field and in other pieces as well, this, 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 this thread of autobi of of um, of of self um, that that one sees. Okay, great. I think that sort of returns exactly to the the theme we began with, which is this iconographic, uh, you know, or this sort of this kind of symbolic field, which um, sort of like the beautiful black iris, which can be read, you know, in so many different ways and should be, and should be. That's sort of the point. And so well, that is precisely the point. If it would not allow for so many ways to encounter it, it would flatten the work and we would lose so much 
right. to pin down on precisely what it is also means that we um, limit pieces to to only one experience we can have. And because I also think that over a lifetime, when you think about looking at work, how often have you encountered a certain piece of work? How you encountered it when you're in your 20s, when you're in your 30s, in your 40s? And I think good work every 10 years, I can look at it. And there is something totally different happening because I am not fixed. So the right. work is not fixed. I enter the work and I re re-encounter work in different phases of my life and uh, good work offers me each time a different encounter mm -hmm. wonderful let's talk about process and material um iris you've mentioned the notion that your work knows more than you do can you reflect on that idea and how it connects to your choice of material and your art making process and I offer these two um, objects as a starting point, and you can see an installation shot of how they are, um, how they're installed in the show. Let me first talk about the, the work. Um, for a long time, I was really annoyed uh, when people asked me about process, because I think I had a limited understanding of what the question was. Um, and as much as I always try to distance myself from conversations about process, I think I'm very much embracing uh, it now because everything happens within the process. I'm so not interested in arriving somewhere. If I ever make something I have preconceived or planned, then um, then I think then it's, I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm, I want to be taken through the process to a point where I'm surprising myself. Um, and here we, we look at those two words, process and material. I, I think I have a very specific way of choosing materials. In this case, we look at pantyhose and, and polymer clay. Um, both things are rather abject, not very pleasing, but introducing them to my process or actually engaging with them is a strategy I'm using very often. Take something which is nothing, take something which is not appealing and then invest in it. And I think investment can basically turn anything into gold or into something meaningful, uh, something charged and something which draws you in. And whether it is obsessive mark making or endlessly touch, um, whether it records my touch or I do bring things together in a context we do not uh, normally look at things. There are different strategies I go about. And, and also in other work, which we're going to see and have seen, um, I often try to make, I try to make do with what I have. And it's not just uh, when I make work, but I also think um, the situations we are placed in, the life we live, very often we are forced to come to terms with the things we are set up with. And that is something I'm, I'm fascinated with. Just give me a pile of something and uh, let me work with it. I think it is that investment and the time spent with something, time spent with somebody, time spent with something is ultimately the, um, the only thing I'm going to leave behind. That alter alteration of investment, um, I think it's pretty much a core of my work. Is it uh, understandable? Very. And it's so fascinating. I'm, I, I'm sure that plays out in your teaching um, very much. Not that that's what we're talking about here, but I think that's a very, um, uh, a very interesting mode to be working in that it, the, the material is actually not the most important part. It's the level of your investment. It is, it is important as I think it is a very important battle that the material is not something, it's not a given, it is not, um, I'm not choosing it because it is nice. I'm choosing it because I want to figure something out within and through and with the material as much as you do. Yeah. I mean, that's why I said like, it's, it's, it's being, it's, it's relationships um, in that aspect. I think my relationship with material is, is pretty similar to relationships with people. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a quick installation question for you, Iris. Um, the this this uh, untitled is set into the wall. This piece is set into the wall. 
do, can you talk a little bit about the meaning of that or the the function of that? I have. I mean, it's interesting because I have uh, here at my wall um, another piece, but uh, which is like a similar piece. Um, one aspect of that I was talking about endless touch, touching, forming, um, obsessive mark making, investment, investment in things. So it is a recording of, of something what I physically do. That doesn't get lost. I think your physical investment in something is translated in the encounter somebody else has with the physical presence of something of of work. Whether that's the same or not, it's not that's not the point. But the all the piece here in which you see like uh, hundreds of like fingerprints of you see how it is made like being and making like falls together is the same is the same thing so you, you see you see a surface which has been touched endlessly so if you approach it and yes indeed there are similarities to white skin um skinness um, you see in the the other piece, the other oval, which you could also say are portraits, mirrors, um, reflection, um, different skin tones coming together. The they are physically doing something with you. They those fingers at the wall have a unpleasant, awkward way of touching you. Without doing it, they touch you without touching that oval you can you go through the experience of touch being touched touching um the connection you make with substance so that is or the i mean when i see those pantyhoses i uh, i know the feeling how you go with your hands over pantyhose i know the smell of um worn pantyhoses um there's something repulsive disgusting uh, sexy comforting so all these things come together just by looking at that material without without actually putting your nose in it mm -hmm. yeah wonderful Devira we talked a little bit about maybe you could talk about the installation needs of such a diverse array of materials but you told me that no those don't guide your installation could you speak a little bit about that so you know as a curator in entering any installation, I have to be concerned and have to deal with the actual materials and the demands of the material. Fiber, paper, all have restrictions in terms of lighting. Um, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I cannot tell people <clears throat> how many times you know, people are so seduced, viewers, museum viewers are so seduced by the the texture that they have to reach out and touch the, the objects at that the moment when the curator lies down and dies because the oils on the wind thinks about if how many people do that over God knows how many years will the piece lists live and will it exist? Will it will it have been modified? Um, so yes, and as a curator, I have a professional um, concern in making sure that I'm addressing in the installation the quality of the 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 presentation of these objects, so that I maintain um, the life of the objects. But there's an I'm more interested in what. And then I go back to a definition of what our very noted um, colleague Glenn Adamson wrote, that in looking at the various, and being an art historian, I'm interested in categorization. And so it's a natural that when I look at Iris's work, I need to classify her. Um, where does she fit? What is her context within 20th and 21st century art? And I immediately was reminded on one hand about what Glenn Adamson has talked about is that of the post-disciplinary artist who uses, chooses specific materials and specific processes 
that best suit the idea at hand. So that was one, you know, that is one thing that I needed to think about when, um, when looking at Iris's work. But I also, and this is something that I think struck me since I have seen the exhibition on view, is that Iris belongs and is also part of the very strong interdisciplinary approach that has marked the 20th and 21st centuries. In other words, what Glenn calls, Glenn Adamson calls the crossing the borders, feeling the need to explore a variety of materials and not just focusing on one particular material, one particular process. Mm -hmm. And even more, I think that seeing the shows at the various venues, it's always a delight to be able to travel a show because you get to see the work in in one or in, in more than one um, venue and in one more than one environment. And you see the work in a whole new context because no museum will install the show when it travels as it did um, before. And so now I, I really see as I try to, and I have to, it is, it, it's an innate characteristic of a curator to classify and categorize that I see Iris as both a interdisciplinary artist because she does work with a, a somewhat limited it is a limited um, vocabulary of materials. Um, it's more than some people do, but she has a limit to what she's doing. Um, but at the same time, she is using, she's identified that material which best addresses um, the particular um, idea um, that she has. Um, the one of the things that I, and we've already talked about it, but one of the things as a curator and as a curator working with um, a living artist is I always, I have always been taught and hope that I will continue to um, convince younger generations of curators of the importance of listening. We have to listen to the artist. It's not, it you, it isn't, it is what we see and what we see of the work. Um, it comes both from the work, but also from what or what the artist does or does not say. Mm -hmm. um, I have been in situations over the years where working with some colleagues, they'd come in, literally picked a show in one hour and walked out. And that was the end of the, the dialogue between um, artist and, uh, and um, uh, curator. And I do feel that those of us who do work with the living artist have a very, 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 very special relationship because we can listen to the artist. Yes, I think that's a wonderful point. Um, absolutely. Let's whether they, say what they, whether they say exactly what we want to hear or not, it's okay. <laughs> That's right. That's right. The contribution can be controversial and also align. Absolutely. Or, or not said. But yeah. what is not said is as important as is what is said. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good lesson. So maybe um, we'll explore some of those ideas here in architecture or the word location versus portraiture. And I think this is a kind of wonderful duality that's evident, Iris, um, in your work and especially in this exhibition. Um, so we can see in this installation of these, these works that are installed here um, as juxtaposed to Gross Schneen, which is a smaller work that's here, which was 
uh, on view in the um, Museum of Craft and Design, but was the loan did not extend to the low, so we didn't have that here. Um, but I would like to hear a little bit about your ideas about architecture and portraiture and how they relate. I would say architecture is the, the cultural portrait of the societies or socio-ecologic political situations we live in. If you think about the, <clears throat> think for a moment about the, the photography of uh, Hiller and Bernd Becher of the wooden beam houses, but also of the mine working in Pennsylvania, uh, water towers in the Ruhrgebiet. So that is not just a building, it is a portrait of a class system, of culture, the fact in that when we think about the world, war all over the world uh, and how much cultural um, portraiture or significance cultural goods have been destroyed, um, the fact that certain architecture in Syria never comes back, nor in Yugoslavia, um, those things are lost forever, and those things are not just buildings, but they are portraits of a time, of a style, taste, name it. Um, so when I use architecture, it is on one hand, of course, this, um, what like those icons or metaphors or um, for belonging, site, belonging, home, um, I'm obsessed with houses, I, I dream houses, I um, have a very special relationship with uh, space and home. But if I make this portrait of the farm of my parents, which is actually a portraiture where I take you um, into my dreams and with closed eyes walk through all the buildings, which um, I know so well, it is not that I want to take you to the representation of the farm, but I want to share for uh, momentarily how I do remember or what memory and space actually how that exists in in, in me. Um, you also see you see another house here, uh, which is stud and supported and uh, a vessel under it sort of is weighing it down that it doesn't move. Um, you see the peace field and as much as that is maybe the portrait of a person it's a portrait of um a field of the surrounding so instead of talking about architecture location we could also talk about inner and outer landscapes because all these things have an inner and outer landscape and the creation of self or identity of self i think is very much a result of the landscapes we grew up in how much we identify the first landscapes we consciously um, experience as children. I think that's something which stays with us. There is a, a way of finding oneself. So you see here the German landscape, which is a rug, um, which is a photo of a rug. So the conversation of landscape and landscapeness, um, I'm trying to find that that very sort of fine balance what conveys landscapeness but doesn't look like a uh, landscape so again the the narrative um versus the icon as you wish so um and could you connect I, these ideas to gross schneen is there it's a portrait of a house you what do you see you see the farm of my parents you see a house pulling uh tension into the space and you see different landscapes fields and um so you only see uh, I mean, buildings and fields. So you are entering my inner landscape. Uh, so the outer landscape, so which I'm defined and which I'm actually able to share with you in this exhibition. Yeah, the inner and outer landscape all in one. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's an inch, it was so wonderful. And I, I really want to, you know, to thank the museum, both the Stedelijk who lent the piece to the to Museum of Craft and Design and the Museum of Craft and Design, who during the pandemic, when it was very difficult for international loans to be secured, put themselves out of the way to get this to, to get Roshnin in the exhibition 
because when you walked into that space and saw this inner landscape or inner and outer landscape of Groschnin at the beginning of the exhibition and on the other end of the show was able to see this idea of this inner and outer landscape of this what we haven't talked about the idea of 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 Heimut, which has been which is one of the themes that very much has um has involved has been of a central concern to to Iris the idea of finding um of of finding happiness of finding happiness and finding fulfillment when um when she reaches this very safe haven and this safe haven for her is this it starts off with Groshnein and then when throughout the show you see this return to this um to to the to to the Germany of her grandparents um and to the to the her um native father and to that point, Devira, these images here, these artworks, are more ways for you to, to talk and guide us through the idea of architecture and maybe location. Uh, these two works, could you speak with, to them a little? Um, the, and I, I apologize, I pri this, we were just talking right now, because this is Lauren, that um, Delsa, am I saying this right, um, Iris? Uh, Velden, Delta Felden, Delta, Delta Felden, um, is one of the earliest pieces. It's actually, I have to admit, one of my field favorites um, in the exhibition. Both that piece and brooch number two are essentially aerial perspectives, but each in their own way, when they are done, is very much expressing the point at which um, Iris is in in her life. Um, the uh oh, the Deutsche Felden. Um, it they both are aerial perspectives. They it is the search for for. Um, it was done as part of the search. Um, in when she was in Amsterdam, looking for the safe haven, and she goes back to the German fields of her of her own youth and of that have been in her family of that of her grandparents and you it, it's to me there was always this thing okay it is very specific she's very specific that she's talking about german fields but if you think about it how many of us in looking at this can think of these little patchwork um landscapes that dot the field that are our safe havens as well. In other words, as what is so much typical of Iris's work, what is the experience for her, we bring our own experiences in terms of interpreting her work. Mm -hmm. Then we look at the brooch number two, which too is an aerial perspective on the, the um, the, the 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 for those of us who live in 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 Michigan, it 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 it, it was done right when Iris came to Cranbrook, um, and it is her way of deconstructing the environment around her in order to familiarize herself um, with the environment. For me, that embroidered grid pattern and very flat grid pattern is very, very representative of the landscape, of the geographic, physical landscape around um around Cranbrook, around around this part of um uh southeast Michigan. It, we are very flat and and Detroit is very much built and its suburbs are very much built on the grid patterns. She juxtaposes that with um, enameled surfaces or 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 um, uh, rectangular forms that that um, respond to 
not only the alial, alial saranin's design for Cranbrook, but the um, academy, the, the most noteworthy acad um, um, our Cranbrook, Cranbrook's um, students, mm -hmm. alumni who contributed to mid 20th century design one cannot help but thinking of Noel and of course of, Ch of Charles and Ray Eames um, that th those are references, those um, the, the little rectangular forms on the fittings very, very much um, reference, particularly the work of, um, of the Eameses. So here you see, or I feel, Iris is trying to, on one hand, familiarize herself, but on the other hand, one feels, in a sense, the apprehension that one always feels that when when one goes into a new environment, one needs to to figure it out, mm -hmm. and one always has a certain um, mm -hmm. uh, tension, apprehension about it. Mm -hmm. Two very different pieces taken from the same perspective showing extremely, extremely differently um, responses. Iris, do you want to speak any more about this topic? Um, or these I works? threw that word, the word taste out um, in an earlier conversation, but I would like to reintroduce it. The one question is, uh, maybe we can talk about it uh, in a few minutes at the end of the conversation is, is it helpful for the viewer who sees the work now to know all the things about it? Is it a sort of way of saying, okay, got it, got it, got it. Does it add something to the experience? Does it limit the experience? Um, and then the juxtaposition of these two things is precisely, I think, something I'm interested in. What happened to me? I, the, the, the production of my identity within different co contexts um, came also with the fact that my taste changed. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's one of the biggest gifts you can get that your taste changes because otherwise you're looking at the same things all your life. I think if you look at these two things, um, my taste, and I think then when I talk about taste, it really is like something I can chew on or something I'm, I'm, I'm like internally engaging with is indeed like with both of those pieces for totally different reasons. Mm -hmm. And my physical relationship with both is also very different. But what I find most interesting is that, that the identity, my identity, which is not clearly not fixed because I do produce in different contexts, very different work. Um, and I do that because I have to deal with very different circumstances and, um, it does something with me much more than I do something with it. Yeah, a perfect segue to our last theme about cultural identity. Um, and we can talk a little bit about your sort of shifting understanding of taste, bringing that word back and um, ideas of identity really kind of reflected in these two works, again, juxtaposing two works from different eras. Um, one piece is produced um, as part of the theory Heimat, which was indeed addressing my relationship with Germany from a different perspective. I think you need the distance in order to see yourself within a context um, and how that context has produced you. So I needed to be away from Germany for 15 years before I even could address that, uh, that relationship. Um, and Tenema timelines is in that aspect sort of another way of understanding and and observing understanding the multicultural the mixture of of nationalities in New York um, by detecting certain kinds of taste which interesting enough are not getting lost um, again you see in both series, materials which I found and grabbed and I had within reach and, and altered and transformed and charged. Um, as much as one is about my past in Germany, the other one is um, observations of people from all nations arriving in New York mm -hmm. and trying to find 
I know, new home, the way they distance themselves from, and how far can you distance yourself from um, your origin and then how far will what that origin actually has installed in you be always present. So I think these two, they are, they both are actually shining light on very different perspectives. Wonderful. And Devira, could you talk a little bit, I suppose, about, you know, in a kind of summary moment here, the the different installations. So here's an installation view from the Museum of Ca Craft and Design in San Francisco, and then uh, an installation view here at the Low Art Museum. And then um, you wanted to bring up a little bit about the Wulleherz and um, maybe as an archetypical archetypal object, um, we might get to that. But start uh, start first, Devira, with the with the the different installations and your experience there. So the, the, and I think it begin, we begin, one of the things one begin when, as I said, it's an incredible experience. And it's one that I'm recently, I was rather dismayed to hear that the museums now are tended, not tending to, to um, promote traveling of shows for various reasons. But I do feel it's a very rewarding experience. Um, to see one exhibition treated in two different um, institutions at the, you know, for the Museum of Craft and Design is about craft. And the presentation there very, very much stressed and fo it followed our original concept of, of how this work should have been seen through, I think, through process, through um, the themes developed and that the process through the use of um, uh, that response, the ideas were, were presented and made using various and different processes and crafts. Um, it's very interesting that when we did our program for MCD, um, both we had a that the last moment we had this this was the the um moderator um the curator of education at the museum raised a question about craft and how important craft was and it was very interesting to see how strongly um iris responded to it and i who am another generation in a different generation from Iris, an older generation, if I can say, um, dismissed the idea of craft and that idea being very important. I do feel that MCD, that it, at MCD, the exhibition fulfilled the mission of the institution with this presentation that did focus on craft and material. But what happened, and now I realized in terms of what happened when we went into the um, low was that this, we gathered the smaller things in the center of the space and the more sculptural works um, kind of circumvent that area. The smaller things are, are usually things that were made in relationship that Iris made starting off as an art jeweler um, in and dealing with the relationship of what she was creating to the body. And there's another whole relationship of the body that then becomes discussed in the more sculptural forms that we see on the outskirts of the low installation. And that to me is, is, a, is, the chain, is a very important change that evolved um, in Iris's work and that we were able to sh use the installation to show. We also, um, in the installation of the show at the low, I, we talked about it and I thought it was important for us to, for us to recognize and Iris, it will become bashful and say that that's not her role in this. So I will take the responsibility for this. To recognize the leading role um, that Iris exerted on art jewelry, 
um, at the at when she was at the Rietveld at the end of the 20th century. And that is the idea and the concept of using knitted um knit of of knitted um wool knitting as such i would say as, yes. but i don't want to say knitting as such because we had in america we had arlene fish knitting metals in the 60s and 70s you are using knitted wool and that's the difference and that is your contribution um to the art jewelry movement we gathered all these pieces through the years that we had selected for the show and they are together to make a statement about Iris's contribution um, to um, our jewelry. So those are the distinctions, I think, um, between the two presentations. Mm -hmm. And it happens when one was allowed, I, it, I say it, it, when you see a show, then new ideas come out of it when you take it to a new venue. And that's why we have the Voldenherzen here for to represent the knitting. Go ahead, Iris. I I would just to um there are a lot of words which um are so uh connected to a hierarchy a hierarchical system uh we handle if we look at art craft design really bored with it I think I think I have there there are no sculptures I'm not making sculpture I'm making objects because all my work really is codependent lives in the world and interacts with other things in the space. And either they if they depend on the person who's placing it or the object you place next to it. Because I do not think I make autonomous pieces which do live alone in the world. Um, it's something I find important to mention. And um, I also think in retrospect, if I look at the exhibition, I think it was a possibility to not pay attention to this is a sculpture, this is an object, this is a piece of jewelry, um, to break down that hierarchy. And I'm I'm always love to mention a gallerist which is here locally, um, Paul Kotula, who very often sh shows um, painting, photography, ceramic, and it is a total absence of hierarchy or whether it is craft or not, and how we categorize those things. Um, I know as an art historian, you need to categorize things. Um, I find, find it a problem and boring and unnecessary. So um, that's why we have different jobs, Savira. But I think in this show, to a certain point, I think it wasn't important anymore, whether we looked at contemporary jewelry or objects, um, whether it was an installation or a presentation. So my aim really is to get beyond that categorization and a hierarchical system in which we are constantly forced and pressed externally. And just because of that, that desire to blur the boundaries between all the art forms is what attracted me to your work initially. Mm -hmm. um, because that, and that to me, that's, that is what, what we have been addressing in the last decades of the 20th century and into the 21st century, this breakdown of the boundaries. And I, that is one of the reasons why I'm so happy we had a chance to work together. Thank you, Iris. Mm -hmm. And before I don't give anyone an opportunity to ask questions <clears throat> with only a few minutes left, um, this is the time to type in your questions if you have them. I did get one question, which was, is there a catalog for this exhibit? And the answer, of course, is yes. It's hard to see this one. I'll put it near me. Um, and I wanted to figure out if if we could talk a little bit about how to access that. I know we have copies here. I'm not sure if they've been sold. Devira, do you know what what how to access the catalog in any formal way? Um, Besides um, through us, which I, I can respond. You, yeah. I think through you or the museum. MCD. Or... Perfect. Okay, so either museum can get you access to those catalogs, uh, Jackie, if you're interested. And maybe we have just about one more minute. Iris, I'd love if we, you could leave us with something about these hearts. Um, you were talking about them as an archetypal object that gains weight in the moment when you're giving it away. I think that's such a beautiful idea and I'd love to hear more about it uh, as our last thought. So you just said it, you feel it more <laughs> if you give it away. I think that's the thing I can add. <laughs> 
Wonderful then, okay. Um, uh, I know that we included these works because they were um, they were uh, made by many people, including you know family members and community members. And um, then you, you did another series during the pandemic, which also uh, connected community members um, around this um, really beautiful uh, symbol. Okay, well, I guess we'll leave it there with um, uh, both of these uh, wonderful thinkers telling us so many things about these objects. I really appreciate everyone attending. We're getting a lot of thank you comments uh, here in the meeting chat. Um, and uh, we hope you all have a wonderful day. This uh, program has been recorded and we'll put it up on the museum's YouTube page where you can find it. Thank you, Devira. Thank you, Iris. Thank you very much, um, Tola. And yes, thank you so very much. Thank you everybody for joining everybody. us. Um, it's been a, a really wonderful to be able to do this. Thank you. All right. Until next time. Bye-bye.